Good afternoon, everyone. I am Su Yuling. I'm a user research uh, I'm a user experience researcher from NetEase Games. It's a pity we could not present in person due to the threat of the COVID. We both recognize the importance of health in daily life. Playing games is no exception. And our talk concerns on players' health too. It's my pleasure to introduce our research on visual fatigue when playing games. So here is the outline of this talk. First, I will briefly introduce some background on visual fatigue induced by viewing screens. And in part two, I will talk about two experiments we conducted to investigate visual fatigue, specifically when playing video games. And finally, part three, I will explain the common causes of eye strain and give some suggestions for game designers on how to avoid them. Now let's start with part one. As we know, looking at digital screens for long periods can cause a series of symptoms, such as eye strain, headaches, blurry vision, dry eyes, and so on. This is also known as computer vision syndrome. With the growing popularity of handheld and head-mounted VR devices, visual fatigue is now a very real threat to the health and gaming experience of our players. Many reports and literatures have also concluded that screen usage might lead to eye strain, especially for long durations. We also hear about players complaining of eye discomfort after play sessions. They wonder why some games lead to severe eye strain, but not the other games. They also try every way to relieve such discomfort. Since user research aims to provide better experience for users, the health of our users' eyes is an important concern for us. We want to know how game playing leads to visual fatigue and how to relieve it. So now we will show two studies we conducted to investigate eye strain for mobile games. In study one, our aim was to set up an assessment tool. We wanted to find an objective and easy to implement indicator and we hope it which is comparable across different things. So by reviewing literatures, we found several different methods, including the first one is self-reporting, which is easy conducted and comparable between different things, but it is obviously a very subjective method. And we also found the second one, the optometric measurements which is absolutely objective, but it is very difficult to conduct. And okay, the last, the third one, psychophysiological methods, which fully meets our requirements. So by using psychophysiological indicators, we measure one's physical states, such as heart rate, eye movement, skin conductance, and so on. Then we use these indicators to infer about their mental states. In this study, we chose two indicators relating to visual sensitivity to infer eye strain. So here is the first indicator we use in this study. That is CFF or critical flicker frequency. It is one of the indicator we use when measuring for eye strain. Here we show is the device we use to measure CFF. An LED light is mounted inside this device. Subjects watch through the eyepieces and they can adjust the frequency of the LED. Now uh, let's watch an animation. Please beware of flashing patterns ahead. Now let's watch this animation. As we can see, 
the LED flashes at the beginning. As subjects increase the frequency, they begin to perceive the flashing LED as continuous. When subjects feel the light is continuous, we then record the frequency. This frequency is the so-called CFF, or the critical flicker frequency. Let's watch the animation again. Now at the beginning, it is flashing, it's flashing and it's still flashing now. Also a bit stable, but still I can feel the flashing. Okay, no flashes anymore. Then in this case, CFF is at 30 Hertz. That means when the flashes increase, the frequency of the flash increase to 30 Hertz, we can no longer feel the LED is flashing. If perceived as continuous to us. So we may wonder how does CFF work as an indicator of visual fatigue? Let's look at an example. Before playing games, I have a higher temporal sensitivity, which means I am very good at discriminating the tiny flashing, flashing patterns. So it needs a frequency as high as 40 Hertz to make me perceive a steady and no flashing light. Any frequency lower than this threshold will be perceived as flashing for me. Then after I play games for two hours and I'm really tired, my sensitivity decreases, which means I can no longer discriminate the flashing precisely. At this time, a lower frequency at 35 Hertz is enough for me to perceive as continuous. This means by comparing the CFF before and after play sessions, we can infer the severity of visual fatigue. If CFF decreases dramatically, we might infer that the eyes must be tired. In contrast, if no such changes before and after playing games, eye strain may not happen. Another psychophysiological indicator we use is contrast sensitivity, which is the ability to distinguish between an object and the background. A traditional method to measure contrast sensitivity is using a chart where the characters gradually fade from black to gray, as we can see in this graph. For example, when I am not tired, I can distinguish the slightly darker letter V from the background. However, when I am tired, I can no longer see the letter V, but can only see the much darker, or another saying, a higher contrast, letter H. So we can also infer the severity of visual fatigue or eye strain from the threshold changes of contrast sensitivity. Besides psychophysiological methods, we also ask subjects to self-report on a scale of one to five points to measure various symptoms of visual fatigue and to check whether the CFF and contrast sensitivity indicators are valid or not. In summary, we have three indicators of eye strain in this study. The first one is CFF, which measures temporal sensitivity. CFF decreases when one is tired. The second one is contrast sensitivity. When one gets tired, he or she can only discriminate a letter with higher contrast. That is, the threshold would be increased. The third one is self-report. It is straightforward. Now we move to the experiment. The procedure was quite simple. First, we asked players to play games or watching videos for 20 minutes. Before and after the screen exposure, we measured their CFF their contrast sensitivity, and also ask them to fill the self-report questionnaire. And at last, by comparing, by comparing the pre-test and post-test results, we can figure out 
to what extent players feel tired. Here are the results. First, the gray bar shows the CFS or the critical flicker frequency before viewing screen. Remember that CFF decreasing indicates players might have a lower sensitivity and we can infer that they may suffer eye strain. Let's come to the results. As we can see, after 20 minutes of screen exposure, CFF decreased more or less. But we also noticed that playing games did not induce more severe visual fatigue than simply watching videos. We also found that FPS and racing game players suffer much than players of other game genres. We also found moderate correlations between CFF contract sensitivity and self-report, which suggests that CFF and CS threshold are effective indicators of visual fatigue. So these are the insights of study one. At the beginning of this study, we aim to find out quantitative and valid indicators of eye strain. Through our psychophysiological methods, we found that CFF or critical flicker frequency and contrast sensitivity they seem to be effective indicators of tiredness. They can be useful for helping game designers determine whether in-game elements could lead to visual fatigue. For example, players may complain that looting indoors induces discomfort when playing battle royal games. It is possible that the brightness of indoor lighting matters so we can compare between a bright and a dimly light house throughout A-B testing. We can combine psychophysiological and self-report data to find out which condition will lead to eye strain. For example, uh, the indicators shown here suggested that looting in the dim, light, dim lighted room, that is the lower scene, might easily lead to visual fatigue. Once we identify this risk factor, we can try to eliminate the impact of such factors. For example, we can reduce the amount of such rooms to avoid playing players cost too much time in such rooms. Or we can address the brightness and give a better transition between darkness and brightness to provide better experience to the players and reduce the discomfort of visual fatigue or eye strain. So in study one, we found effective indicators. These indicators, including psychophysiological indexes, which are objective and sensi sensitive. And self-report is very useful too. And we also found that FPS and racing game players suffer the most. In study two, we wanted to further understand the underlying mechanism and hope to shed light on how to relate the tiredness. So we chose FPS and racing mobile games to further study visual fatigue. And we also brought in optometric measurements in this study. By reviewing literatures, we borrow three optometric indicators. The first one, when uh, during the players playing games, one may focus on the screen and they blink much less than usual. This might lead to eye dryness. So we use the indicator tear break up time or TBUT to assess for dry eyes. TBUT shortening imply that eye dryness and discomfort might occur after or during the playing session. The second and the first indicators were related to accommodation ability of the eyes. As we can see, when focusing on distant objects, ciliary muscles relax and the lens were flattened. 
In contrast, when focusing on near point, ciliary muscle contracted and the lens were thickened. It might lead to ciliary muscle tired after a long duration when focusing on near points. So we use two indicators. The first is anterior chamber depth or ACD. And the second, accommodation power or AP to assess these symptoms. Change of these indicators implies that ciliary muscle are tired and might lead to blurry vision. In summary, we have three optometric measurements in this study. The first one is tear breakup time, which is a clinical assessment of eye dryness. The second one is anterior chamber depth. When the eyes focus on near point for a long duration, anterior chamber depth or ACD might temporarily shorten, suggesting that the ciliary muscle get tired and need rest. The third one is accommodation power. It is also related to focus adjusting. When one gets tired, the accommodation power would be impacted and the image cannot project to retina precisely and hence leading to blurration. By using these optometric measurements, we can further understand the mechanism of visual fatigue when playing games. The procedure for this study was very similar to study one. It involves pre-game testing and one hour gameplay session and post-game testing. Here shows the results of CFF and contrast sensitivity. As expected, CFF and contrast sensitivity were impacted after each play session. Notice that the decrease of CFF and increase of contrast sensitivity both means eyes get much tired after playing. But we found no differences between playing FPS and racing games. The optometric measurements show some interesting results. On one hand, tear breakup time decreased after playing both games, which was similar to results from previous studies. This result implies that dry eyes and discomfort could occur after one hour exposure to the screens. On the other hand, anterior chamber depth or ACD and accommodation power or AP were impacted only in FPS games, but not in racing games. As we can see here, anterior chamber depth and all the ACD, it decreased, suggests that after playing FPS games, ciliary muscle get tired temporarily. And the time cost of accommodation increased, indicated that accommodation power was also impacted eyes needed a longer time for complete accommodation after playing FPS games. That is, the, our eyes' reflective and focusing powers are strongly affected by playing FPS games. It might be cause of uh, in which or in the FPS games, it involves more camera turning motions. The results of study two suggest that the effect of visual fatigue differs across different game genres. First, uh, tear breakup time might indicate the result of exposure to digital screen, and it was a general effect. ACD and AP were specific to FPS games. This may be due to this general demanding more rapid eye movements and frequently shift in focus distance. So the ciliary muscle might get much tired after FPS gaming and hence lead it to the decrease of ACD and impacted AP or the accommodation power, which is just a fancy way of saying that 
the eye's ability to adjust focus may be temporarily affected after playing FPS or shooting games. In study two, we use optometric measurements to further shed light on the mechanism underlying visual fatigue. FPS games may be different from other game genres. It requires lots of eye movement, focus shift, tiny discrimination. It is much higher visual demanding comparing to other game genres. So playing shooting games for a long duration might lead to temporary impairments to visual function. On the other hand, the results of tear breakup time also suggested that exposure to screens for a long time will also induce eye dryness, even though not playing shooting games. Okay, then at last, we came to some conclusions from our own studies. And combined with review of other literatures, we have summarized the common causes of visual fatigue. This is the information that designers can use to build better games for our eyes. So the number one cause of visual fatigue is high brightness. Here, we use Life After, a survival mobile game, as an example. During alpha test, players often complain that they feel eye strain when it rains in the game. By, anal by analyzing the graphic and comparing with other games, we found that this was caused by raindrops that were too dense and too bright. So in the official launch version, we cut down the density and the brightness of raindrops to improve users' experience. And we also received good feedback on this iteration from our players. And the second common cause of visual fatigue is low contrast. Obviously, in a very low contrast condition, it will make it very difficult to see and find useful information in the scene. For example, the same plan is much easier to identify and to tell the details in the right picture than in the left, which with lower contrast in the left. We can imagine that with too low contrast, players will squint and have a harder time playing the game, and which would lead to faster visual fatigue. And another factor is about FOV and camera sensitivity. It is another common cause of visual fatigue, especially in shooting games. This clip shows how a narrow FOV plus high camera sensitivity can make players dizzy. Now let's uh, watch this animation. First, FOV with 90 degree, it seems uh, still acceptable for us, right? Then with 140 degree FOV, it gets much better and much smoother. But with a very narrow, only 30 degree of FOV, it looks very dizzy for the players. So of course, we do not say that never use narrow FOV in your games, but it is, uh, but it should be very careful to use such settings. As we have seen, a narrow FOV with high camera sensitivity will lead to eye strain quickly. A compatible camera sensitivity with FOV would provide better experience for players. And another factor relating to camera is steadiness. Let's take racing games, for example. As we can see from the clip, the car position is not always the keep the same during players playing the games. Let's uh, watch it again. As we can see, when the car slows down, the car position is more closer to the players. And when the car accelerates, the car was far away from the players. 
The relationship between car position and speed is shown here. When the car brakes, the car gets closer to the players, and when it accelerates, the car moves away. This position changing is a frequently used trick to provide a stronger speed sensation to players. And most of the uh, situations, this trick we use will not induce visual fatigue or visual discomfort to the players. But in some other games or in the extreme conditions, the car position changes too obviously and too suddenly. And this will make players feeling that the car is something like jumping and the camera is not steady and the camera they feel is very shaky. And this will lead to visual discomfort. So what can we do to avoid or relieve visual fatigue when we developing our games? Our first suggestion is conducting A-B testing that use effective indicators of visual fatigue. When designing new maps, adding new elements, or making any changes to your game, you can use A-B testing to identify elements that might cause visual fatigue and try to reduce its impact. As I explained earlier, CFF and contrast sensitivity and self-report are very budget-friendly indicators of eye strain, especially contrast sensitivity. All you need is a contrast chart or a computer to conduct the test. By combining various methods, we can find out the risk factors and try to eliminate them. The second suggestion is providing options for players to set their preference. By customizing displayed options, such as brightness, FOV, camera sensitivity, players are more likely to find parameters suited to themselves. We also can provide better experience by reminders and game setting during play sessions. First, a so-called 20-20-20 rule is recommended by eye doctors to prevent eye strain. Basically, they suggest that every 20 minutes spent using a screen, one should try to look away at something that is 20 feet away for a total of 20 seconds. Return to game design, we can recommend a rest stop when players have been playing for long durations, especially for kids and youth players. Also, we can utilize adaptive brightness features on phones or other devices to address the screen brightness according to the game content and environment lighting. This will make a better experience of the eyes. So in summary, we talk about CFF and contrast sensitivity are very effective psychophysiological indicators of visual fatigue. They are objective, easy to conduct, and comparable. Using these indexes in A-B test can help us identify risk factors of visual fatigue. We also talk about some common causes leading to tiredness, such as brightness, contrast, a match FOE, and unsteady camera. At last, we can also do something when players playing games. In-game settings, such as reminding automatic brightness, can relieve ice chain. Finally, credits. The work I showed today was done in collaboration with Jay Wang, my colleague at NetEase Games. And we want to give sincere thanks to Professor Wang, Wang Yousheng, who from Guangdong Optometric Association, who provided optometric measurement and data analysis for the second study. That is all of my talk. You can follow us on social media. And thanks for coming and enjoy the rest of GDC. Thank you very much.
Hi, that was um, super interesting and informative. Um, it's interesting because you're looking at the phenomenon on, in terms of discomfort. That's your ultimate sort of variable you're trying to predict. But the first thing that I thought of was um, a lot of times in game design, you try to get people to notice things. So for instance, you want them to notice that there's a button they should press or they should notice a state change in a HUD element. And so if you think about tiredness, not just as an end result, but also as like cognitive load could be tiredness, the more tired you make the player using the, the variables related to, to eye fatigue, they actually make it harder for you to be good at the game because it's harder for you to notice the things that you need to notice. And so I'm, 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 it's interesting that while you're measuring for fatigue, there's, there's <laughs> gameplay implications as well, and that's why sound and other modalities can be effective. But I've always struggled to find a way to, to describe to people why adding more blinking lights and things like that are gonna help with noticing things. And so I found your research fascinating because you actually gave me sort of some scientific underpinnings to, to display it. So I guess my question is, are you, um, have you also thought about taking your research to how do we make people um, better at learning and playing and mastering these games through the sort of principles that you're teaching um, as opposed to, uh, or in addition to making their eyes less, less tired at the end of the experience? Mm -hmm. uh, in my understanding, uh, we po uh, when in the game settings, we could, uh, as I mentioned at the last session of uh, my talk, well, we think it is a good idea to uh, introduce some uh, eye healthness uh, knowledge to the players and tell them, uh, uh, for example, uh, every uh, maybe every 20 minutes or every 30 minutes uh, playing games, we can recommend a rest to the players. And it, we, and also uh, we can use the, we can monitor the uh, time the players using uh, per day or monitor the lighting environments of the players to provide a better experience to the players. And also we think it is uh, some politician and effect or guidance to the players, especially for the kids and the youth players to reduce the usage of the screens. And we also, uh, we also found that to from the, uh, not only in our study, but also in the other literatures, uh, a long, a very long duration exposure to the screen is not so health to the players, no matter how old the players are. So it's, it's, I think it is uh, both responsibility for the game, de uh, game designers and uh, polit uh, politicians or the governments. Yeah. Uh, I hope I, I can answer your questions. Thank you.